Dude, this is Baldur's Gate. Welcome back. In today's video, we're going to create a character in Baldur's Gate 3. Don't get too excited though, for we're not actually creating a character in the game itself, but we're going to go through the character creation process and talk about the choices that were given and what they mean. Now, we haven't seen everything in the game, but we have seen quite a lot, enough to be able to present a video that will help prepare you for early access or the official launch of the game. The choices that you make in character creation are very important, so you're going to want to at least have a basic understanding. I still remember the first time that I played Baldur's Gate 2 when I was just a young little tadpole. See what I did there? And the character creation made me feel like I was in an Ivy League advanced chemistry class or something like that. Don't worry though, for once you have that basic understanding, it's not that hard. In fact, you might actually appreciate that the game developers have added so much depth to the very start of your journey. It really helps make you feel unique and adds a lot of replayability to the game. I'll stop rambling and let's get right into it. So this is the character creation screen that you'll be presented with after you watch a couple cinematics to start the game. If you notice at the top of the screen here, there are six different tabs to go through. The first one is the tab that we're currently on, and that is selecting your origin. The second tab is selecting your race. Third, we unfortunately did not get to see, and that appears to be the customization of your character's appearance. Fourth is your class choice. Fifth is the ability points and skills. And the sixth looks to be the overview screen where you might see your choices and maybe hit the accept button to start your journey. So on the first tab, the origin tab, we first have to choose if you want to create a custom character or use an origin character. For a custom character, you will choose everything on your own. It's your creation. You can name him or her your favorite name, make him a Tiger King lookalike. You probably can't do that in this game. You can create your own backstory, etc. If you decide to play an origin character, you will still choose some things, but the foundation of your character is already built. The main appeal for origin characters is typically the unique story that they provide for your journey, such as if you play as Gal, you are a wizard who has some type of bomb in your chest that is going to blow up if you don't take care of it, or if you play as a Starian, you are a vampire spawn who has his own set of problems to deal with, etc. There will be five origin characters to choose from in early access, and feel free to pause on these screens to read more about them. Lizelle, Gal, Shadowheart, Will, and Astarion. For a custom character, you will more so create your own journey. Be who you want to be, first following a more predetermined type of story. Larian has said that custom characters will still be heavily involved in their own story elements, so don't worry too much about not getting the full experience by playing as a custom character. So let's say we have selected a custom character. Our next choice will be to choose male or female, and then we get to choose our character's background. A character's background will establish what type of life your custom character had before he or she started on his Baldur's Gate 3 journey. As you can see here, there are many choices and will likely be more upon the game's official launch. The guaranteed choices so far are charlatan, criminal, entertainer, folk hero, and noble. And the other ones Larian did not scroll over for us. I did already do a video on all of the backgrounds that I think will likely be available and what they will do for your character, so feel free to go back on my channel and watch that. So let's choose the noble background for our character. It reads as, one of Faerun's wealthy and powerful scions, well accustomed to their family's privileges. Now this doesn't mean that you have to be a snarky, entitled a-hole, you could very well be a well-respected noble who is generous and understanding of everyone's life circumstances. Choosing a background will likely have an effect on certain in-game situations, such as if you're a noble you might experience different dialogue options when you speak to other nobles or people of political power. Character backgrounds also may have an effect on some of your starting equipment in the game. A noble might spawn in with more gold in his pocket and a nice set of clothes. Choosing a background will also likely give you two extra skill proficiencies, and possibly proficiency in one or more tools. So a skill proficiency will help you in skill checks dealing with that specific skill. As a noble, we would receive skill proficiency in history and persuasion. So if the game presents us with an ability skill check, our character's chance of success on skill checks dealing with history or persuasion specifically will increase. Your skill proficiency number will increase as you progress in the game. Its value will be a number that you can add to your dice rolls when the game wants to test you to see if you can succeed in a certain skill. So as of now, I have created a male character with a noble background. Now let's talk about race. I have heard that there will be 15 total available race choices. 
So far, the confirmed races for early access are Tiefling, Drow, Human, Githyanki, Dwarf, Elf, Half-Elf, Half-Drow, and Halfling. Your choice of race will definitely have an effect on your character, and we're going to create a fake Drow. If you notice here, playing as a drow will give your character plus one to charisma, give you dark vision, drow weapon training, and then that little box with the icon is a special cantrip spell you will also be given. So charisma is an ability, and there are six abilities in the game. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Each ability is an indication of a character's physical and mental characteristics, and your character will likely focus on two or three of these abilities. The boost to charisma in this case would make a drow a good choice for classes that use a lot of charisma, such as bards, paladins, warlocks, and sorcerers. These classes go great with the drow race, for they all use charisma as their spellcasting ability. You of course don't have to use one of those classes, there are so many possibilities in Baldur's Gate 3, and you can gain your charisma from other places than just your race. Dark Vision will allow our character to see better in the dark. Drow Weapon Training gives our character weapon proficiency in rapiers, short swords, and hand crossbows. So if you're interested in one or more of those weapons, consider Drow for your race, especially if your class choice does not give you proficiency in any of those weapons. When playing Baldur's Gate 3, you will want to use a weapon that your character is proficient in, for it will increase your chance of successfully striking your opponent in combat. We are also given a special cantrip spell by playing as a drow, and this is called Dancing Lights, which will help us out in dark situations. If we quickly take a look at the human race, we can see that they are given different things than the drow race, and the Githyanki offers its own features and so on. Now if we scroll over the dwarf race, you will notice a sub-race category, which some races will have and it will offer you more variety in your choices. So if you choose Hill Dwarf, for example, you will get that plus one to wisdom, while playing as a mountain dwarf might boost your strength ability. So you're really going to want to kind of plan out what type of character you want to play, so when you're doing your character creation, the choices that you make will go well with your vision. On to the next tab, everyone's favorite, classes. I've also done an in-depth video on the available classes in Baldur's Gate 3, the link to that will be below if you would like to learn more. So your class choice is obviously the most important choice in terms of how you would like your playthrough to be. If you enjoy magic, you'll want to choose a class that has a lot of magic options, such as the wizard. If you want to focus solely on physical weapons, you might want to be a fighter. If you want to use magic and use physical weapons, you could still be a fighter but maybe follow down the fighter's subclass called Eldritch Knight. There are many options available, and each class typically offers at least two unique subclass paths that you can journey down. There will be at least 12 classes to choose from in Baldur's Gate 3. These are the 12 that have been confirmed. Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard. Looking at the rogue class, which appears to not be finished at this time, you see that by choosing the rogue you automatically get these two actions. These are class specific actions for the rogue, one is called sneak attack melee, and the other is called sneak attack ranged, both of which give you extra damage to an attack made while sneaking. Now if we look at the cleric here, and then we go to the wizard class, you can see that when creating your class it varies greatly from one to another. I'll have to do some class specific guides in the future. So the first thing we need to do is choose a subclass. And like I said, most of the classes should have this subclass choice. And once you do a little research on them, you will likely find one that suits your playstyle the most. Looking at the cleric here, you can see that life domain is a subclass choice, and this will favor players who love healing, while the cleric subclass of war domain might favor players who want to be more offensive with more physical based weapons. With our drow noble here, I want to play a warlock. So let's take a look at the warlock. On the Warlock, we have to choose a Patron, which will represent our subclass. The choices will likely be the Fiend, which we can see right here, the Archfey, and the Great Old One. The Patron you choose will affect the spells that you learn and are able to learn as you progress. We will go with the Fiend, for it's the only subclass that we can actually see. As a Warlock, we get to start off with two cantrips of our choice and two spells of our choice. As you play and progress, more cantrips and spells will become available. Cantrips are basically magic that don't have cooldowns, and spells are magic that require spell slots to be cast, and those spell slots will replenish after resting your character. I'm not going to get too much into that right now. 
So if you look at the bottom half of the Warlock screen, it shows zero out of two cantrips and zero out of two spells. What this means is when you click on edit, a list of available cantrips and spells will pop up and you will choose which ones you want to use. And like I said, as you progress in the game, you will gain more cantrips and spells and these cantrips and spells will vary depending on which subclass you have chosen. There will likely be other things that you will gain from choosing a class in this game. We didn't actually see it in the gameplay, but I'm almost certain it will be in the game. And that's when you choose a class, you will gain proficiency in a certain type of armor, which for the Warlock, I'll gain proficiency in light armor. Then you'll gain a certain type of weapon proficiency, which for the Warlock, I would gain proficiency in simple weapons. You might gain proficiency in certain types of tools. And then for saving throws, you will also gain proficiency in two abilities, which for the Warlock, that's wisdom and charisma. I'm not going to talk too much about that because those are videos on their own. So now we have a Mal Drow Noble Warlock whose patron or subclass is a fiend. The race gave us race specific features, our background gave us more proficiencies, and our class choice made us a warlock. Now on to the ability points and skills tab which perhaps might be the most confusing to someone who's not familiar with these terms. So on this tab, you're going to select where you want your ability points allocated and then choose which two skills we want to gain proficiency in. This is very important in terms of how successful your character will be. If you notice, there's a little star next to the Charisma ability. This is telling us that Charisma is the Warlock spellcasting ability, and if you remember, we gained a plus one to Charisma by choosing the Drow race. Before we talk about how you can allocate these points, let's first quickly talk about what a higher ability score will do for your character. The higher an ability score, the higher your modifier will be when dealing with that specific ability. Modifiers are used in situations such as ability checks and attack rolls and many more. When you roll dice in those situations, such as an ability check and attack roll, a modifier will then be added to your dice roll which can greatly increase your chance of success or it can hamper you a little. For example, if the game gives you a strength ability check to move a boulder, you will roll one 20 sided dice, then add your strength modifier to that roll because strength is what is being tested, and you will try to tie or beat the difficulty class number that is assigned to the situation of moving the boulder. If you have a higher strength ability score, your modifier will be higher, allowing you to add more to your dice roll than someone who has a lower strength ability score. I won't get into too many details on how that modifier number is actually calculated, for I will do that in another video, but just know that the higher your ability score, the higher your modifier will be. The lower your ability score, the lower your modifier will be, and yes, it can go into the negatives. So when in combat, your character will do an attack roll to determine if you hit or miss your strike, and your ability modifier will be added, so it's extremely helpful to have a high ability score in your primary attack ability. As a warlock, our spellcasting ability is charisma, while a dagger wielding rogue will use dexterity. To allocate your points where you want them, you can use a point buy system. The lowest ability score that you can have is 8, and the highest allowed is 15. If you have more than 15 at character creation, it means that your racial bonus must have given you more. So to do the point buy system, let's take a look at this chart. We are given 27 points to spend, and this is how you will spend them. If you want the max 15 in an ability, it will cost you 9 points. If you want the lowest of 8, it costs you nothing. If you want 12 points in an ability, you can see that it costs you 4 points out of the 27. Using this chart, you will use up your 27 points. So we're playing as a warlock and we want to have the max of 15 in charisma. So we put 15 in charisma, which uses up 9 points from our 27. The 10 points in wisdom costs us 2 points, 13 in intelligence costs 5, 14 in constitution costs 7, 12 in dexterity costs 4, and 8 in strength costs us nothing. That totals 27 points spent, and we get that added plus 1 into charisma because we're playing as a drow. So our character here will be much better than the average Joe in using charisma and constitution, but our character is pretty bad in strength situations with only 8 points. Our strength modifier is going to be in the negatives. I know it can sound a little confusing, but if you just use the chart, it is fairly easy. Put the most points in the abilities that you want to excel at, or the abilities that you need to excel at, and less points in the ones that are not as important to you. 
To make it easier, Larian also added the Use Recommended button, which should allocate your points in a safe, useful way for the class that you have chosen. There also might be a randomized point system that will randomly give you your ability scores, and this will allow for a more interesting or challenging playthrough if you so choose to use it. So now let's move on to the skills. So every class that you play will allow you at least two skill proficiencies. The choices of skills that you're given will differ from class to class. So choosing a skill will give your character proficiency in that skill. And unlike choosing your background, you're actually given a list of skills to choose from. So when a situation in the game comes up that uses that specific skill, if you're proficient in it, you'll have a better chance of success. Your proficiency bonus is kind of like a modifier in terms of it's a number that gets added on top of the dice roll. In this case, you would do your dice roll, add your modifier, and add your proficiency bonus. If we're playing as a rogue, we will be able to choose four skills from this list. Acrobatics, Athletics, Deception, Insight, Intimidation, Investigation, Perception, Performance, Persuasion, Sleight of Hand, and Stealth. So if we chose Sleight of Hand as one of our skills, then we're better trained in successfully pickpocketing. When attempting to pickpocket, the game will give us a Dexterity skill check. A higher Dexterity ability score will help us with the modifier number, but also being proficient in the Sleight of Hand skill will allow us to add even more to our role, further increasing our chances of success. For the Warlock, you can see that our choices are Arcana, History, Investigation, Nature, Religion, Deception, and Intimidation. Let's say we chose Intimidation as one of our skills. So being proficient in the Intimidation skill will help us in situations such as trying to get answers out of someone. I will also do a skills video in the future. Your skill proficiency will increase as you progress in the game, making you even better in those skills. I will and I have already done more specific videos on many of the terms being used in this video, so check out my previous videos or stay tuned for more in the future. So our first character is a Mal Drow Noble Warlock in service to a fiend. Let me know below if you guys have any ideas for future videos, I will certainly take them into consideration. I hope this video helps some of you guys understand the basics of character creation. I know it can be a little confusing, but I promise you once you get that basic understanding, it becomes a lot of fun. There's a lot of possibilities. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you guys enjoyed the video, please like, comment, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. It's a huge help to my videos. I do all sorts of videos on this channel, ranging from comedy videos to live streams to game reviews to product reviews, etc. I would love to see some of you guys on a future video. More Baldur's Gate 3 content on the way. Until next time.